I'm Colt Hamilton. I've been here at Hamilton Native Outpost for 27 plus years managing livestock. Got a lot of practical experience there, but uh, barely graduated high school. I'm Cleo. I graduated from the University of Missouri with a degree in animal science and an emphasis in ruminant nutrition. And I'm here at Hamilton Native Outpost learning how to manage grasslands for the purpose of raising livestock. We're out here and there's a bunch of indigo around us and I was wondering why the cattle won't eat the blue indigo if it's too fibrous. So this is filled with white indigo that has a lot of Indian grass in it. We're going to graze it with cows and they won't eat the white indigo. Uh, they, they don't eat any of the indigo, blue, white, or creamy. We believe from our observation it's not too fibrous. I've seen cows eat quite a bit more fibrous plants than this. Um, they've got a digestive tract that can really break part of hemp rope if they want to eat it. The thing we believe it is is plant secondary compounds. So a plant secondary compound would be like peppers or spicy. There's really nothing about spicy that helps a pepper grow mm -hmm. other than other things don't want to eat it. So it generates a spice inside of itself just to deter the river. Mm -hmm. Peppermint, other mints, all those are plant secondary compounds that discourage a river. We don't really know what white indigo makes. I haven't spent a lot of time eating it to see. I assume it would be bitter, uh -huh. but there's a lot of plant secondary compounds out there. Like I said, I don't know about white indigo. I do know like white beard tongue. It's got a compound in it that plant animals actually love the flavor of white beard tongue, but it slows their heart rate down. Mm. So they learn to moderate how much they consume a day because it will slow your heart down. Uh, willow trees have aspirin in them. Same aspirin you take out of a jug for a headache, there's aspirin inside willow trees. So there's a lot of different plant secondary compounds. White indigo, we believe, have one to keep them from eating it. But it still makes nitrogen, just like the other legume, still feeds the soil. It's still a good part of a grazing operation. And then you look at them, they take virtually no sunlight away from the grass around them. It's like a big mimosa tree. Yeah, you, know. you want to point out one of them? Yeah, this, so here's a kind of a classic white indigo look. It's upright, it's about two and a half, three foot tall. Leaves are really spread out to collect a lot of sunshine. But when you look down through it, you can see the grass all the way down and in through it. And you can tell the grass underneath them is no less suppressed, is no more suppressed than the grass around them. Yeah, I mean that prairie drop seed looks fine underneath yeah, it. Don't mind it all. The root system difference, white indigo has a root that goes really deep. That prairie drop seed's fairly shallow within a foot to two foot of the surface of the ground. So, you know, not a lot of competition in life for anything. Do you think one indigo, white or blue or creamy is better than the other? Or if you have some, it's probably good enough? No, I don't really think so. Uh, my answer to about everybody and everything is diversity. Yeah. If you can have two, why have one? If yeah. you can have three, why have two? Uh, there's different plants, different bugs, different pollinators that are all counting on different ones and now a lot of times soils will determine where the three are mm -hmm. creamy indigo will grow on the driest rockiest spots you got white indigo kind of likes wet mesic places uh, blue indigo kind of likes the wet mesic uh, where blue indigo really loves to grow is we call them saddles on a hill a little more so shady. If you're looking at a hill from the side you got a hump and a low saddle and a yeah. hump water comes to converge in that low saddle and that's where blue indigo loves it gotcha